Welcome to the uh, March 28th uh, Sunday School lesson here at Dan River. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get in, involved in anything else. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you and call upon your name. This is a special time of the year when we recall that Jesus at this time went through his death on the cross, paying the penalty for our, our sins. He took all the world's sins from past, present, and future on himself. And it was victory that day for Christians. But still you have to take that free gift that he did it just doesn't come upon you automatically. But we thank you, Lord, for his sacrifice and his, his death and more importantly to his resurrection. We thank you for the opportunity to come here and study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The death of Jesus. You know, when I think about it, from the very first day that Jesus was born, and every day of his life, you might think he was either loved or hated. You think about that day he was born. The shepherds rejoiced at the angel's announcement that that uh, Jesus was born, and good tidings of great joy to the whole world. A little later, as the Magi and the wise men come from the east, they found themselves going into the palace of Jerusalem to talk to Herod, the king. They were looking for the newborn king of the Jews to worship him. Herod didn't know anything about it. But he said, when you find the child, return to me that I may go and worship him too. So as they left, they, they did eventually find Jesus and gave him their their gifts and everything. But then they were warned not to return to Herod, that he had ill intentions about it. Well, after the Magi left Herod, they, Herod uh, collected his wise men and the scribes, and he said, where would the Messiah be born? And they searched the scriptures and found he would be born in Bethlehem of Judea, just a short distance from where they were. So Herod, instead of going to worship him, he got up uh, an army, uh, a, a group of soldiers, and he sent them to Bethlehem in all that region, and they killed every baby, male child, that was born two years and under, trying to get rid of the rival. So we see that Jesus came in to both love and hostility, and he lived that way most of his life. The common people, the masses, accepted Jesus. And they believed in him. They, they, they loved his teachings. He seemed to be one that spoke with authority. And not only that, he was healing people of blindness and crippled people could walk, even raising people from the dead and curing all manner of diseases around him. On the other hand, the ruling classes, the chief priests, the scribes, the Sadducees, elders, they had a different opinion about Jesus. He was a, a thorn in their side, a problem. He didn't come to them. They, they couldn't see he was the Messiah because in their opinion, they were the highest order of uh, example of righteousness and in their minds. And if if the Messiah would come, he would surely come to them. 
And when he did, that's a good sign to them that this man is an imposter. They couldn't believe in him. They, they, they just couldn't accept him. But they also, on the other hand, they couldn't explain how he was able to uh, outdo them all the time, how he could overcome all these illnesses and cure people and things like that. The other thing they were afraid of was his popularity was growing stronger and stronger each day. The multitude, the fear of that growing acceptance and uh, and their rejection and, and their, his, their, his rejection of them also irritated them. Uh, they said something had to be done with this man. Something had to be done with him. But what? You know, he seemed to win any encounter with him. When when he would come out and speak in parables, and they would challenge him on different things. And they never quite could get on top of Jesus. They'd try to catch him in an error. Should we honor Caesar? He says, well, let me see the coin that Caesar's picture was on. He said, render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and under God the things that are God. They try to trick him all the time, but it, he always seemed to overcome them and win any encounter. In John eleven forty seven and 50, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. It's surprising he used those words, that one man should die for the people. Didn't realize, actually, they were saying a truism there, that that's exactly what Jesus came to do, for to die for all the people. Not just then, but the past, present, and future. Is what God was, he was up to. But now they, with all that decided, we had to do something, they said, but what and how? So in the dead of the night, away from the sight of the people, they arrested Jesus. And they did so with the help of one of his own, uh, Judas Iscariot took their money to betray him. And to betray him, why, they could have had him. Jesus said, you could have had me any day. I've been in the crowds in the temple all around. Why didn't you arrest me then? But the real reason why was they wanted to do it in the absence of the multitudes. They didn't want any interference. They didn't know how the people would react to his popularity and everything. So that's why they did it in the dead of night. And even though the Jews thought they were uh, ridding themselves of a problem, namely Jesus, it was really God's plan that they were completing. And it was coming to fulfillment. And neither the Jews nor the Romans nor any other entity could stop it. And now we get to the to the lesson in John 19. Verse eight through eleven. Let's let's begin reading there. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was more afraid, and went again in, into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest not that I have the power to crucify thee? and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power 
at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivereth me unto thee hath the greater sin. After his arrest, Jesus was taken to first to Ananias, the former uh, chief priest, who was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who said that they had to do something that I already read with this man. It would be expedient that one would die for the people, if you remember. They took him to them, and they interviewed him and questioned him and ridiculed him. And from there they sent him to the Sanhedrin and on to Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea and and, uh, Samaria and Edema. Pilate would have preferred no involvement whatsoever. He didn't want to be involved at all in the matter. But now Jesus was brought to his doorstep. Now he had to do something with him. He allowed his soldiers to beat and mock him, to scourge him, and hoping this would satisfy the Jews. After all that, he offered to release him. And he offered, uh, they had where they could free one man, a prisoner named Barabbas or Jesus. And he offered uh, Barabbas or Jesus. They chose Barabbas. They wanted to crucify Jesus. The Jews demanded Jesus be crucified because he said he was king of the Jews. And they didn't believe that. This accusation caused Pilate to become a little fearful. When you start talking about someone being establishing himself as a king or some kind of rebellion about to come up, Rome wouldn't wouldn't like it. They would not excuse him if he overlooked a possible rebellion in his uh, control or even a rival king that no, no matter how important he was, Pilate had to do something. Pilate sensed also something unusual about this this man. He wasn't at all like the Jews tried to paint him to make him look like. Pilate asked him, "Whence are you? Where do you come from?" Before, when Pilate had talked to him before. He said uh, he was a king, but his kingdom was not of this world. But now, being asked the same question again, where do you come from? Jesus responded with nothing, gave him silence. That angered Pilate. And he said, speakest thou not to me? You're not going to answer me or speak to me? Don't you know that I that I have the power to crucify you? And I have the power to release you? Don't you know that? And to this I want to say this. Do you think that threats scared Jesus? Was Jesus afraid because he said that? And my answer is going to surprise you, I think. And shock you maybe even. I know I, I'm surprised at myself. But say, I say, yes, it did scare Jesus. But not for the reason you think. You see, Jesus was afraid that Pilate might release him. He didn't want to be released. Jesus came to die on the cross. And if he got out of that, it would, would defeat everything that they came to do and accomplish. He was afraid he, Pilate might release him, and that must not happen. Doing so would stop the whole plan of salvation. They would have to come up again with another way. So Jesus challenged his words. He says, and these words would have angered uh, Pilate, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given you from above. 
you you know you're telling a procurator uh taking care of the uh whole region to tell him that he has no power when you know he does. Pilate was beginning to realize this was an exceptional purpose. Man. No ordinary man. And when it came to Jesus, neither Pilate nor the Jewish leaders nor Rome's emperor had any power to overcome Jesus. Over Jesus. It gave Pilate caused him to stop in his tracks. He gave him pause. He didn't know what to do with this. Uh, he stood on the threshold of using his power in opposition of God, even though he didn't believe in God. He knew many did. And they had heard of the great power of the God of Israel when when he backed the people of Israel. God often let bad things happen to Israel because of punishment and things. So they were on the threshold to hear what to do. How could, what could he do? His wife told him, let this man go. She was afraid she had dreams about him. Let him go. Pilate felt the same way. He saw nothing wrong with Jesus. And he told the people several times, he's innocent, I find no fault in him. And then while he's thinking and trying to decide what to do, Jesus comes up with another statement that kind of confuses him even more. Uh, Jesus added, He that delivereth me unto thee hath the greater sin. Now, who's Jesus talking about? Who, who delivered him? I, I suppose he's talking about the Jewish leaders. They're the ones that brought him there. They're the ones that want him executed. And their sin is greater. And maybe he's given Pilate a little pause to think, you're not going to be considered as bad as they are. But it's still a sin what he's about to do. You know, uh, once uh, Jesus was asked who would love him the most, and he told a little story about two debtors. One had a great debt, uh, debt and the other one smaller. And the man that had the, uh, the, the, the debt with him uh, he said the one that he forgave the most would uh, love him the most. And Jesus said, that's right. He, The one whom Jesus forgave the most would love him the most. Who would hate him the most? That'd have to be the one that's willing to choose to ignore Jesus is free offer of salvation. Enough that you would be willing to take a chance going to hell rather than accept his free gift. You know, we're not informed enough to know how God will, will judge, but I know this. With God, he knows all. He's the judge and the jury. He knows our thoughts before we think them and before we say them. He knows us inside and out. And so, just another way of saying he knows the whole truth. And uh, maybe that's good for for someone that is trying to say they're innocent and no one will believe them. But God knows. And God forgives them. Or the other ones that are lying. They think they could pull the wool over God's eyes, but they can't. To God, we're like a, an open book. And he's read the book completely through. Let's go on down and read uh, 
16 through 18. Then delivered him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth unto a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. When they crucified him and two other with him, on either side, one, and Jesus in the midst, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, the charge that the Jews didn't want to see. The chief priest there said, don't write it that way. Say, he said he was the King of the Jews, and Pilate stood firm and said, what I have written, I have written. You know, even though Pilate pronounced pronounced, uh, Jesus innocent several times, the crowd wouldn't have it. Uh, He'd come out and say, I find no fault in him. Yet he finally caved in and gave in to their pressure. Because they would yell every time he said he's innocent. They would come back with, if you let this man go, you're not a friend of Caesar's. And who makes himself a king is against Caesar and against Rome. And they were saying those things and saying, if you let this man go, we're going to let's see that he gets back to Rome. That scared Pilate. He didn't want that to happen. So Pilate couldn't risk such a message getting back to Rome. So he washed his hands of the whole thing. And he gave in to the mob. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he was crucified along with two others. Now let's jump down to John chapter 19, 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a set of vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon a hyssop and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What was finished? His work on the cross was finished. The work of salvation. The penalty was now paid. The perfect lamb. The only thing that could take away the sin of the world was the perfect lamb of God. Jesus was that, the only one that could do it. You know, uh, that that concludes this uh, message, but I do want to say a couple more things. There are two prayers that Jesus made uh, that I want to talk about. One before the cross and one from the cross. The one before is in Matthew twenty six thirty nine. And he went a little further and fell upon his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So that's a prayer he prayed before in the garden. Not only did he pray it once, he prayed it three times, pretty closely together. Each time, he said it was like he was sweating great drops of blood. The cup he was talking about was the cross. And was there some other way, some other means that God could accomplish, the Father could accomplish what he wanted to accomplish? But he prayed that, but before he even let it finish, he said, but not my will, but thine. Each time he said the same thing. And he each time backed it up with your will, not mine. I think if he hadn't done that, God may have answered that prayer. But I think he was afraid he would. So he 
said, not my will, but thine. That's one prayer I want to talk about. He submitted to God's will rather than his own. The other prayer is out of Luke twenty three thirty four. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. That was from the cross. Here they are executing him. He's hanging on the cross. They're parting his garments, gambling for one piece that they didn't want to tear apart. He said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He didn't do as he did in the garden. He didn't say, not my will but done on that. He let it go just like that. And I wonder, he let that prayer stand. Did God answer that prayer? I think he did. And I believe God would have honored that prayer of forgiveness for them who beat and cursed and executed him, scourged him, and killed him. And I want to add, close with this question. Were they forgiven? I, I think so. And I got some scriptures here I want to say, but I'm not 100% sure of what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, but I want you to think about them. And it's in Romans chapter 11. Let me get it. 11, 11 and 12. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and diminishing of them be riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. Now I want to jump on over to uh, chapter 11, 25 and 26. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so, here's the part I want you to listen to particularly. And so all Israel, A-L-L, all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And then two more verses I want to give you. 32, 11, 32, and 33. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that they might have mercy upon all. He said, every one of them sinners. Now he said, I'm going to have mercy on all of them. Oh, the depth of riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways are past finding out. You see what I mean? There's the word used there, all. And all means all to me. Uh, and I think God could do that, but is he or will he? I don't know. But I wanted to bring it up just so you can read it for yourselves and think about it. He could be just talking about the remnant or the after, after the church has been removed from the world. I don't know all these things. And so I admit that. But I thank you for listening to this lesson and, and, uh, if you got any answers on it, let me know. Uh, thank you.